Welcome to Civil Defense Radio with your host, Preston Schleinkofer. Civil Defense Radio is more than just a podcast about a new American civil defense structure. Through our total media presence, our website, Facebook, and Twitter pages, we work to inform you of the many serious threats, both natural and man-made, that our nation faces. Those issues many news outlets are afraid to speak about or unwilling to mention. We believe this total information approach will assist you in making the best possible decisions about the safety and security for yourself, your family, your neighborhood, and community during disastrous events. Civil defense equals resiliency equals survival. To be resilient, it takes preparation, organization, and training to meet the needs of whatever situation we may find ourselves in. Civil defense helps reduce panic in a disaster, and we want to be part of your preparation. We strongly recommend establishing a community-based civil defense organization in your city or county in order in partnership with your local emergency manager and community leaders. We offer guidance on our website at civildefenseradio.com under the resources tab. Look for the guide at the top of the page. It's enough information to get the discussion started. And also, we are always here to help. We ask that you regularly download and listen to our shows and visit our web and social media platforms, often at civildefenseradio.com, on Facebook at Civil Defense Radio, and on Twitter at civil underscore DEF underscore radio. Now, let's get back to our show with David Womack and the Black Sky Event movie. Welcome back, David Womack, with the BlackSkyEvent.com. So, David, can you tell us about some of these great people that you had the pleasure of meeting and interviewing for your your show? Absolutely. Um, you know, when I started this out and was watching congressional testimony and everything, um, I was amazed at how many people are out there that really have have given their their lives and and made it their focus to make people aware of this and uh, stake their whole career on it because I mean this is not a high paying uh, gig you know what I mean yeah. Yeah. <laughs> these people are not getting paid buku bucks to make people aware of uh, things that are going on in the electrical grid but I mean we interviewed people like. Um, Ambassador um, James Woolsey, who is the current, uh, the um, former director of the CIA, and you know he has great insight to threats and and what people. A lot of these people that I interviewed still have you know high security clearance. Now they would you know when I talk to them, you know they have to be careful what they say. Especially there was a lot of people we couldn't interview because they still do specific work for the government that they can't talk right. about. Especially in the cyber arena, they're very, very cagey about that. But, um, but yeah, interviewing um, uh, Ambassador Woolsey was was quite a treat, and and he had great insights from his experience, you know, running the CIA for years on threats from China, from Russia, from Iran, you know, from North Korea, and about how you know, warfare has changed since the Cold War. And we really got into that and because I, you know, and and how um, sixth sixth generation warfare is different from the last war we fought, you know. So the next war we fight will be very different from the last war war we fought. And, you know, in that vein, we also interviewed uh, General Quast, who is in charge of the Electromagnetic Defense Task Force and for the Air Force. He's still, he's a three-star general. And he gave us great insight uh, in that arena also and uh, to what the military is currently doing to, per- to start to protect against EMP because it's a big problem there too. I mean, we spent so many years after the Cold War focusing on regional wars that we, we lost the big picture. But now, unfortunately, not only Cold War enemies, but, but smaller rogue nations and even terrorists are a threat to our electric grid. It's very vulnerable our Achilles heel and our enemies know this, yes. you know, so he brought a lot of great insight into that as also did David uh, Stuckenberg, Major Stuckenberg, who uh, actually authored the report and put everything together is brilliant and uh, did a great job with that. He actually worked with uh, Ambassador Woolsey uh, to put together the report. So um, other than that, I mean, we also interviewed um, 
uh, former General uh, Ken Krosniak, who's a retired Army general who had a lot of experience and, and knows this issue deeply and is very passionate about it and spends a lot of his time, um, you know, promoting um, the issue and, and trying to get people to, to move forward with it. And he was great, very knowledgeable. He was, he, I believe he's a professor in the War College, and so he has a great understanding of that kind of stuff. Um, we also interviewed uh, Ambassador Henry Cooper, who was, um, he was testifying in the, for the last EMP commission uh, in Congress, and he was the one that really um, has gone out and tried to actually interface now with some of the power companies and and come to solutions he's working with at duke with duke power to try to come up with some solutions to protect the grid and to make sure that uh, which is uh, another huge problem we face is um, a nuclear meltdown if the grid goes down which is a whole nother issue that complicates things and you know we'll have a lot of environmental disasters but he's trying to work with duke power that has a unique situation down there to create a model to um you know, circumvent that and to protect us from that threat. So he was great, but he was he was fascinating because a lot of these guys have real world experience with electromagnetic pulse. Uh, Ambassador Cooper was uh, with Ronald Reagan um, when he was doing SDI, uh, the Strategic Defense Initiative. So he understands you know missile technologies and EMP and EMP threat, and uh, you know. It, it, it's just a, a lot of people in our current generation have no experience with it, even in the military. And so it's, it's great to have a lot of these guys that had actual experience that were around when they did the original tests in 1962 with Starfish Prime, you know, and, and how we reacted to that when we found out that an electromagnetic pulse, what it would do when it knocked our satellites out, it knocked out lights in Hawaii. And uh, unfortunately, you know, a lot of that information was classified until the EMP commission came out. And a lot of these guys worked with the EMP commission or, you know, on it to, to bring this out. And they're really carrying the torch forward. Another uh, great person we interviewed was George Baker, who was actually the technical advisor for the EMP mm. commission. And so uh, he's a professor at James Madison university now, and he's, He's extremely knowledgeable about EMP and the effects of EMP. Uh, he, he has all the technical knowledge. It was fascinating to talk to him. But, um, you know, all these people are, all the people that I mentioned are, are actually a lot of the people that have advised and helped uh, the current administration form policy, the, uh, the EMP policy that's now being implemented. So we're really fortunate that, that we have an administration who, who is listening to the problem. And, you know, this is not a political issue. This isn't a left or a right thing. The power grid, if it goes out, it goes out for all yes, of us. Yes, you're right. And I think everybody on both sides, a lot of these guys, Democrats, Republicans, it doesn't matter, you know, because this is, this is an existential threat that we all need to face. And, you know, the, the, the great thing is there are things we can do to fix this problem so we're not so vulnerable, so we don't have to go around yelling the sky is falling. And, and I think with the documentary, that's what we're trying to make people realize. We're not just telling you that the sky is falling. We're telling you that, you know, we need people to move forth and to come forward and convince their congressmen, their senators, the people in power in states and local areas to do something about it and to make plans. Because if we have plans and we're ready, and if the grid goes down, we don't all, you know, move into disaster and catastrophe. There's no reason for our enemies to attack us. It's no longer a vulnerability. So if we can get to that level, that's what we want to do. And that's the whole reason I made this documentary is to raise awareness about this issue and get people talking to their leaders and saying, we need to become more resilient as a nation because this is a real threat. And in a couple of nanoseconds, you know, you could lose your way of life. And it's, it's, it's hard for people to understand. They all think it's science fiction, or many of them do, because they don't understand you know, the effects of, of an EMP or other uh, um, catastrophe on the electrical grid and what would happen. And they don't realize that you know, we don't have food stockpiled anywhere. There's no big stockpiles of food in America. We're on a just-in-time economy. 
So after that food runs out at the grocery store, guess what? It's not being resupplied. So, you know, there are so many issues that make this so complex that it's just it's just amazing. And then a lot of other people that we interviewed, we interviewed Frank Gaffney, who's with the Center for Security Policy, who has been on this issue. I pulled up something on, um, I think, a Heritage Foundation video from 2011. He was in there. And he is brilliant. I mean, he's a very smart policy guy, and he worked for the Reagan administration and others, and so he understands the threats from our enemies. And of course, like I said, for solar, for the solar threat, we talked to uh, Bill Murtaugh, who is the uh, director of the NOAA Space Center in Boulder, and he was amazing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we've talked to a lot of people about the specific events and have tried to put it all together um, and, and the big picture so that people can understand it. And it's not just about EMP. I mean, even with, with physical threats, for instance, uh, Tommy Waller, I know you know yes. Tommy, and he also, um, he, is the, he runs the Secure the Grid uh, Coalition, and he's been instrumental in um, just putting, helping me put everything together with this because his um, knowledge of this and, and and he just knows everybody connected to the issue. And, uh, but, you know, he was talking about, he, he was a Marine. He's still in the reserves. Um, and, um, uh, but he also works for the center for security policy, but, um, the, uh, the, he was talking about physical attack and, you know, there are a lot of people in the electric industry who totally discount that, that, that the grid could be taken down by physical attack. But, you know, we have a serious lack of imagination, with our, some of our leaders and some people in the industry that things could happen to take down the grid for by combined attacks, by physical attacks, or... Yeah, the, the Metcalf substation incident, I think it was 2012, tw- right around there. Yes. Um, that was that was a yes. proof of concept for whoever did it. That's what some, some people, um, some special ops people figured that... Uh, you know, when they went out and, and surveyed the, the grounds and, and saw the, the, the stacked up rocks where each gunman, there was three gunmen that uh, fired on the, the transformer, um, they, uh, they, they said, this was, all, this was all pre-planned. And the way things went, they, they believed that it was a proof of concept for future attacks. Absolutely. And I think that... Uh I mean, a well-trained group. Look, I mean, when I interviewed Jeremiah um, uh, from Red Team Security, they, you know, they were breaking into these power stations and substations with stuff they got from Amazon, okay? <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like they were, you know, I mean, they know what they're doing, but it's not like they had the backing of a nation stick, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And um, now these weren't the huge uh, transformers. And, you know, we didn't talk about uh, uh, all of his clients. Of course, he couldn't re- reveal who they were, um, but um, they actually, um, you know, they have film of them. Uh, and we have some of this for the documentary of their of their trips actually to break into that, which was pretty fascinating what they were able to do. You'll be really interested to see, you know, <laughs> You'd be amazed to see what they were able to do with a small team. I mean, it just, it was just was amazing. So, you know, and they really, I mean, you know, they really, the industry doesn't look at this as a big threat because they, you know, you take out one substation and it's not a big deal because they just route power around and stuff. But, you know, if you had coordinated attacks against specifically targeted units, um, I mean, there was a, uh, this actually came from FERC a few years ago. There was a specific number of transformers that you could take out uh, these really high volume custom made transformers that you can't replace. Basically it takes about a year and a half to replace them. And they're made in Germany and, and South Korea and they're all, you know, they're custom made and almost impossible to move in. It takes a, a specific uh, train car because they're so huge and you have to close down traffic. And so imagine the grid, being down and them trying to replace those. I mean, 
So the FERC study said that if there are specific locations and there's a specific number of these that you could take down with a physical attack and cause the grid to fail. So that's not me saying <laughs> it, you know, that was yeah. FERC yeah. who makes, who approves standards for NERC. So, you know, it's, it, there's, there's a lack of imagination or a lack of, of wanting to believe that. And, and not only, I mean, in Medcalf, the physical attack was, was by uh, weapons. Yeah. You know, there, there, are, there are now electromagnetic weapons that with close proximity, you could do the yeah, same it's a, thing. Yeah, it's a handheld EMP. More. Yeah. Right. Well, the... Devastating. I mean... Yeah. The technology is 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 out there. Just that most of us don't, you know, we can't we can't think of the the technology that that some of these some some people have developed for various purposes that that can be used. And I, I was told that the size of a regular van, you can drive by a uh, power station and essentially shut it down just from the the electrical magnetic pulse that would come from that device that was inside of a van. So the grid is very vulnerable from a physical standpoint. And the cyber, you know, uh, Ted Koppel wrote a book that that was published in 2015, and he talked all about how the Chinese and the Russians, the Iranians and the North Koreans were already inside of our grid with with little robots that are going around finding vulnerabilities and just waiting for a command to, to shut things down. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, you know, the interesting thing about cyber is that, you know, the, the Russians and the Chinese, you know, um, uh, if they ever hit us with a cyber attack, there's, there's, they usually use a proxy, you know, they would use somebody from North Korea or <laughs> yeah. Iran or yeah. terrorists. So you, you can't always attribute who, the attack comes from therefore to retaliate is almost impossible and that that sets up a complex problem of uh, of of defending the grid and i mean because there's no deterrence there's no immediate fear of retribution which makes it you know a problem that 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 just keeps happening i mean they they are in the systems and as they map them and and know the systems i mean the chinese and the russians probably you know, could shut down the grid now or big, large portions of it. And the, and the um, North Koreans and the Chinese probably don't have that capability from what I've read at, the, at this point and what I've understand, understood from our interviews. But, but you know, they're quickly catching yeah. up. Well, if and, you... Um, it's, hard to de- it's hard to defend the grid because, you know, the grid, <laughs> I mean, you've got all these SCADA systems and SCADA systems are nothing but little computer yeah. boxes that 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 control the physical um, aspects of of turning things on it's and automation. off. Automation, and um, it's 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 all automated. Mm-hmm. Everything is automated. So you really um, you know you attack that, and um, they also look at um, an EMP as a cyber attack. Believe it or not, so uh, Russia and China do not view. Uh, exploding uh, nuclear EMP, uh, you know, 400 miles above the United States as a nuclear attack. They view it as a cyber attack because it's it's not affecting, it's not physically destroying stuff. Yeah, you're not killing people directly. It, you're killing electronics. Mm-hmm. So... In their minds, and that's that's an important point that people need to realize because people, oh, they would never nuke us. Well, they don't look at it that way. They look at it as, you know, uh, an electronic uh, yes. attack. I mean, that's that's how we were able, if people don't believe EMP works and electromagnetic weapons work, um, you know, we... The United States in the Iraq War, look how quickly we defeated the fourth largest military in the world, the Iraqis, in the first Gulf War. That's when <laughs> electromagnetic weaponry really uh, was the first time it was really used extensively in an invasion like that. And we took them out so fast because we took out yeah. everything. We took out their command, their control, their electricity. They couldn't talk to each other. Well, imagine an enemy doing that yeah. to us. Yeah, yeah. 
And because if because ninety five percent of our military bases are on the public grid, it's a huge threat. You know, even to the military. Yes. So well, I wanted to make a point here. You know, you were talking about um, about what it would take to repair the grid. Uh, it would take a year and a right. half to oh, yeah. to manufacture the parts and get them over here and then move them into place and all that. The EMP Commission reports that within a uh, twelve to eighteen months after the grid goes down, ninety percent of Americans would be dead from civil strife, disease, lack of food, clean water, and uh, just hard hard living because we don't have the skills right. to live like Little House on the Prairie. So we would be stuck. And right. 90% of the population would be dead. And so then they, they get all these, these power uh, transformers back up. So who's who are they fixing it for? Well, and who's going to bring them back up? Do you think after a month of the grid being down, when our financial systems collapse too, <laughs> because there's yeah. no stock exchange, there's no – who's going to yeah, work? Our dollar is, is – you know, Nobody's going to worthless. work. Nobody's going to be – I'm, I mean, look at even Katrina, where, you know, that was just a week. And how many guys from the police force did you have? And, and not to knock emergency responders, they're great. But you know what? If, there's, if, if you've got a choice between your family and, and somebody else and there, have, there haven't been provisions made ahead of time to take care of your first responders' families and stuff like that, they're going to do what any of us would do. They're going to go take care of their family. You're right. You know, they're not going to let their kids die. And uh, so those are the kind of things we have to think about when we think about this. We have to think about food. I mean, with our just-in-time supply, there's no food. I mean, there, you know, I don't know. I mean, I live in Atlanta, so, you know, we have uh, an inch of snow down here in the grocery stores, you know, (laughs) (laughs) overnight. Well, imagine that happening, and there's no resupply coming. Yeah. There's no resupply coming from anywhere because there's no transportation. Because if the grid goes down, guess what? Natural gas goes down. Uh, gas, you can't pump gas. You Communication goes down. I mean, there are generator, backup generators on uh, you know, many of the uh, other infrastructure. But guess what? After two or three days, there's no diesel fuel left. If, and there's no uh, natural gas coming in to power any of those generators. So after a few days, um, you are really uh, without any of the other uh, infrastructures in this country that give us this wonderful life that we have now. And it's all because of electricity and technology. I mean, you can't do technology without electricity. And unfortunately, everything in our life, I mean, name one thing that isn't affected by technology now that we uh, depend on for our survival. Right. You yeah. can't. You can't. There's none. So it's it's a big problem, and thank God there are people looking at it, and there are companies designing products. I mean, I've got one in my hand right here that one of the guys gave me, and it's a neutral blocker. You know, so this is something that they put on the electric grid that would keep a surge from like a a, a solar storm, because what it does is it you know. I mean, I'm not going to go into real technical stuff, but basically DC power comes on a line and it's an AC line. So this runs the DC power, you know, it runs into this blocker and it shoots down into the ground. I mean, and there, there are companies out there who have great technology. There's one that they are, have installed out west uh, at a company and they have a technology that uh, uh, senses an EMP or a GMD and uh, throws a switch that that uh, shuts down or moves to these transformers to protect. Mm. But unfortunately, from a nuclear EMP, you know, you have E1, which takes out computer yeah. chips and phones yeah. and stuff like that. And um, so uh, you would have to build basically Faraday cages around stuff to protect yes. for that. I mean, that's that's the most devastating of all, and that's why. Um, it's just the most devastating. I mean, because there's, it's really hard to defense, or, uh, defend against it. There's so many components that would be knocked out, you know, uh, that 
it's it's just a it's a it's a tough problem. But there are companies out there working on it, and you know, the sooner we all realize and insist that this problem be fixed, you know. There are solutions. We've got brilliant minds in this country, and we interviewed a bunch of them, and they've got great ideas. And uh, you know, this is a problem that can be fixed. Yes. We don't need to go down the road of 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 everything being destroyed and our civilization civilization being set back two hundred years. Yeah, you know? and or and that would that would happen in pre-industrial civilization. Yeah, that would happen in in less than a blink of an eye with an E1 pulse from a uh, yeah. uh, nuclear. EMP. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, um, mind numbing when you, when you think about it. And that's probably why some people don't want to, uh, prepare because they don't want to think about the, uh, the situation that they would be in if, if something like this happened. But, um, you know, yeah, but we interviewed, uh, some, some great people, you know, because we wanted to talk about preparedness a little bit and talk about, you know, the challenges people would face and make them realize the challenges. So we interviewed you. You were a great interview for, uh, you know, talking about civil defense and and Michael may be talking about civil defense. Both of you guys have so much practical experience and you know what you're talking about. And that's, you know, that's the meat of everything. We're trying to get people who know <laughs> what they're talking about about this because one of the things so many people in this fight to, you know, shore up the grid are doing is pointing fingers and saying, well, that's not right, that's not right, that's not right. So we've tried to pull together the the best experts from from all interests and and put out the truth about what's going on. And, um, you know, we also interviewed Dr. Arthur Bradley, yes, you know, yes. who's, a, who's a doctor... Um, a PhD and he he's brilliant. He's a NASA scientist mm-hmm. and he is uh, huge, you know, in the preparedness community and, and believes that, that we need to prepare and has even developed some devices to protect your home from an EMP, I believe yes. now. Yes. And, um, and then um, John Hollerman, who's a former SEER trainer and understands the psychology and of deprivation and, and, um, and what happens to people in situations like this and how they act. And I thought that was very important for the documentary because so many people want to paint a rosy picture um, about how it would be if the grid did go down for an extended period of time. And it's, there's no rosy picture to paint, you know, and I think John is, I think you had him on your show. actually. Yes, I did. It was a pleasure. And uh, And I've read his book and, and uh matter of fact <laughs> like just like with uh Michael Maybe's book I uh I highlighted the heck out of it <laughs> you know there were so many yeah. good parts in there He's probably in my opinion I he's got one of the best survival uh survival theory is his book and I I think it has a, the most realistic view of uh survival that um that is out there that I've found other than um, uh, this, uh, I just read a book. I can't remember the guy's name, but it was from, uh, and I haven't interviewed him, but he was, uh, he, uh, survived Sarajevo. Oh yeah. Selko and, Begovic. Uh, you know, yeah. Selko, yeah. Yes. And that was a fascinating read. And I'm actually uh, trying to reach out to him to interview him because I mean, he's been through what we would go through. I mean, his situation was a little different, but the same effect of, of the psychology of what happens when your neighbor's kids don't have food to eat yes. and what they will do and what people turn into when they're desperate and people who are your friends and you had over to your house and, you know, if you have stuff and they don't, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. So we never want to get to that. You know, we can fix this problem. We want to get to the solution and it's going to take some time, but we have to keep everybody on the track and get more people involved so that we can fix it. Yeah, I had a, a friend of mine. We were, uh, he he's, lives almost across the street from me. We were talking one day, and um, he says, he says, if uh, Antifa coming down the road, uh, I'm coming to your house. I said, no, you're not. He looks at me like, what? And I said, hey, if they're coming down the road, <laughs> we should have been planning two weeks before, and uh, it's too late. You know, now, now it's not the time to try and organize. The time to organize is before the threat happens. And that's what preparedness is all about. That's right. why, you know, um, he he knows that, 
you know, my, my background, he, he's a retired special agent. And, um, so he's got, he's got, you know, strong law enforcement background, but, uh, you know, I add to right. my, my law enforcement background, my military background, and, um, I've had some specialized training and stuff with, with my law enforcement and stuff. So, um, I see things in ways that, that a lot of, even just regular cops don't see. So, uh, um, you know, and that's one of the things I think that, um, that, that allowed me to, um, wake up to this, this situation and, um, and actually start taking it seriously because I was, I was working intelligence for my, my, uh, organization, my law enforcement, federal law enforcement organization. And, and we were tracking, um, alien smuggling and trafficking and part of, part of the alien smuggling trafficking, uh, networks, they introduce terrorists in there as well. So we were tracking terrorists, you know, or possible terrorist, um, uh, methods and, and all that. So, I was I was looking at things on an international basis and I started seeing these threats and I'm I'm starting to wake up and I'm noticing things that are going on um around the country. Back then it was there was a lot of a lot of cops um getting getting killed, getting in, attacked and and uh, getting you know in trouble. And so uh I'd been I've been looking at this stuff and I'm going this this ain't right. You know, something something's going going on because it's not getting any better, and so I started looking right. more. And about that time, I got married, and you know, I had a wife to take care of, and we were both working in D.C. So I couldn't just leave her, you know, let her go into a shelter. I was like, no way. I, you're my responsibility. We're 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 getting out of here. So um, I built get home bags for, for both of us. And we figured it'd, you know, take us a few days to get home and all that. So we had everything planned out and that's what it takes. It takes understanding the threat, right. which is what your movie does so fabulously, uh, at least the, the trailer. And I'm, I'm sure that it gets into it because I, I know some of the people that, that you've interviewed and, and you interviewed me and the information that, that we talked about. So I, I see that as, as a huge, um, benefit for the average person, but also a um, a way to wake people up to the threat. Because you know, once once this thing comes out, I'm going to be sending links to everybody. You know, <laughs> hey, you got to go watch this movie, whatever. <laughs> and so, uh, what you're doing is you're validating everything that I've been saying to my friends who think, ah, you're crazy. You know, and. Right. Uh, so well, you know, this is this is the problem. I mean, because I mean, so many people I know. I mean, I met a lot of people in the preparedness community, and this is, you know, within the preparedness community, a lot of this stuff. I mean, I have a lot of stuff that is probably new new news to a lot of people, um, because we put a lot of separate things, in, you know, together. We put the big picture together, so so people can see the big picture, and maybe individually a lot of these things don't lead to a high probability that at some point we'll lose the electric grid. But if you take them collectively, it sure takes the probability up a lot more. And as we rely more and more and more on technology, I mean, we're more and more vulnerable. And I'm glad that the federal government is actually at least admitting I mean, um, Michael maybe did some great work, and you have mm. too in this area with uh, civil defense and and FEMA and the NIAC report that came out um, that was basically saying, hey, we, we have no plans for a long-term outage. We Our government is not prepared to take care of you in an event that, involves a catastrophic event like the grid going down that involves the entire country. Yeah. There's no Calvary yeah. coming. There is, and I mean, we have, you know, we have the documents, we have all of this that we can show people so that they understand because you can say that all day long and people think of Hurricane Katrina or they think of Hurricane Michael or they think about things like that. And that's a totally different regional 
small issue. I mean, those were huge issues, but I mean, compared to, um, you know, the electric grid going down and having to respond to an event of that magnitude, it's a whole different ball game. And our, our country and our government at this point are, are not ready for it. And that's why people need to take preparation to a personal level and to a level, I know another thing that you and Michael work with a lot is on a, a community yes. level. And I think that's so important that communities, because you can't survive on your own. You have to have a community. And if all of our communities started banding together, even if 40% of our communities got to a point where they could be resilient for 90 days or even 30 days, I mean, you know, that they had a stockpile of food, that they had mm -hmm. plans if they lost power, that they had microgrids set that were protected. All of these things, if we do on a smaller level, collectively add up to a big deal. If 40% of us can survive, we can probably carry the rest of the 60%. Yes. But at this point, we can't. I mean, it's, there's, people don't have enough. Governments don't have anything. I mean, I think that you may know this better than me, but I think they said the federal government, FEMA, they have like 3 million MREs set aside, mm -hmm. right? Something, Something like that, that, or maybe 7 million. But it's matter. not enough to, to do that to scratch a surface. The American people for yeah. one day, yeah. for yeah. a meal. <laughs> I mean, if you think about how much it takes to feed a town, I mean, uh, you know, how much food it takes to feed one person for a year. It's incredible. Oh, yeah. And I mean, the amount of food that you would need to stockpile and put back to feed people, because we don't even have our grain reserves that we used to have, yes. you know? And, um, and it's just, that's one thing I think that struck me more than anything. I, I, I think, you know, at the beginning of this journey that I've taken and to learn so much by really interviewing all these amazing people is that, is that food. I mean, you know, it's, it's food. I mean, there's not enough food. You can't grow the food. There's no stockpile food. I mean, most of us, unless we did live in a desert, if you have a way to purify water, you know, you're going to be okay longer than food. Although you need water a lot more. Most of us that don't live in the desert have access to water that you could purify, right, right. you know, and, um, until sanitation and stuff came in. But I, I was really amazed at the, um, at the impact that, that, lack of food and the disasters that would um, precede the grid going down. That also surprised me a lot, like the nuclear power mm -hmm. plants going down. I never thought oh, yeah. about them melting down because <laughs> why would they melt down? Well, because they don't have any power to pump water. Because they don't power themselves. For cooling systems. <laughs> and they have a limited supply. And, yep. and, you know, it's just, it's amazing. You go down a rabbit hole, and sometimes when I talk about this, I go down a rabbit hole because it's just one thing cascades on You're another, right. cascades mm -hmm. on another, cascades on another. Cas and it makes it so complex that, you know, my theory a lot of time, too, is that people just shut down when you talk to them about it because it's just too big of a problem. Yeah. And they can't understand it, and they can't relate to it. And some of them, I've had people say, well, if that happens, I just want to die. <laughs> That's you know. that's a that's a and defeatist I said, mentality. Well, I can't I can't uh, fathom yeah. that. I don't know no, why anybody would say I can't, that. I couldn't relate to that because because I have kids and wives and family, wife and family and loved ones, and you know I care about them. And my first thought when I read one second after was, you know, what would happen to my kids? Yeah. yeah. You know, this isn't about me. I'm worried about my kids. Yeah. You know, and my wife and my family and. And and what would happen to them yeah. if something like this? Happened? Our kids are dispersed throughout and, the country. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, we've got one in Washington State, yeah, one in California, and, and uh, you know, with with yeah. grandkids, and then in Maryland, we've got kids up there with grandkids. So uh, uh, yeah, we're we're kind of spread out, and and what would you know what would happen to all those those kids of ours and our grandkids? My my wife just. You know, she just goes crazy whenever she even begins right. to think about that. It's not something that she even wants to address. So, um, no, no, it isn't because you may never talk to them again. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say. But, you know, in a situation like this where there's no communication and there's no way for people to go anywhere, mm -hmm. I mean, roads clogged. I mean, it's just, it's just, 
it's yeah. terrible. And I mean, it's, it's, I'd never thought about that really before I started this, that people that live farther away, you know, it's going to be really difficult for them to get to you or you to get to them or to even communicate with. Yeah. It's, it's so, tough. Again, it's just this giant rabbit hole you go down. So what, so what we've tried to do with the documentary is kind of bring everything around and, and we, we're touching everything. I mean, we're in editing now. I mean, we've started editing. We're still shooting, too, and we're editing it the, the simultaneously. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like I said, we have 600 pages of transcripts <laughs> of interviews. So that's a lot to that go is. down. So I think what we're, we're, what we're talking about doing, too, is – is you know the documentary will be the overview but then we've got all this great material from these interviews so you know as bonus features and stuff like that we'll we'll also uh, probably cut some longer form interviews so people who want to know more and want to dive deeper can listen to the interviews in in full and hear these great minds Mm -hmm. you know yeah get the knowledge from them because they're you know they're amazing Well, we're uh, we're running out of time here, um, David. It's been great having you on the show, and and uh, you want to tell everybody again how they can get a hold of you and where they should go to view your your trailer and any other information you may have on your your website. Sure. Yeah. If you go to theblackskyevent dot com. Uh, you can read about the documentary, and uh, you can watch a trailer there. We're working on a new trailer with everybody we've interviewed, and hopefully within the next, I would say, six weeks I'd be out. We hope to have the documentary out um, fall, early fall, middle fall. <laughs> <laughs> We're kind of – it's hard to say because with – with uh, uh, distribution, you know, it's not always us handling that. It's it's other companies, and so depending on the the distribution channel that it that it goes out on, we'll we'll have an exact day, but it will be out uh, in the fall. So we're excited about that, and um, you can send us an email. There's a contact form on there at the bottom of the website that you can just put your email in, and and we'll send you updates as to when the film is is coming out. We won't bombard you or sell your information or anything. We just use that to communicate with people so they'll know when the film's available and to update you on on what's going on with the film. So uh, it's been a great ride, though, and and we really are looking forward to getting it out. Good, good. All right. Well, um, again, thanks for being on the show. It's been a pleasure, and uh, I look forward to speaking with you again, uh, maybe just before your your film comes out and we can we can do a little tease to everybody at that time and so okay <laughs> well as you can tell we had a great time doing this show and uh i want to i want to thank david again for being on our our show as a as a wonderful guest and um i just want to say the top-down governmental approach to solve our community resiliency problem has failed us. We need a community-based grassroots approach to solve this problem of resiliency. We are looking for volunteers throughout the nation to pick up the mantle of civil defense for their communities. Let's start a conversation with the guide found on our resources page at civildefenseradio.com. Be sure to check out our regular postings on our Facebook and Twitter pages. Facebook, we're at Civil Defense Radio, and on Twitter, we're at civil underscore def, D-E-F underscore radio, where we post often about the threats that we see. Well, our guests, we we thank uh, David for being on the show again, and to you, our listeners, I really appreciate you being there this week and continuing to to follow our program, which uh, we're, we're trying to make this a uh, an informational show for you so that you can be enlightened on the things that are going on around the country. It's such a job to keep up with this, but we're dedicated to do it, and this is what we want to do. So uh, please be safe, be informed, be prepared, and may God bless you and keep you until next time. Thank you. Goodbye.